Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the MBO Partners uh, webinar series, uh, which uh, we're really happy to have a, a great uh, attendance. And um, today we have a very interesting topic, and I'm really happy to uh, introduce our, our guest speaker today, uh, who's going to talk to you about how do you disrupt yourself and the four key rules for reinventing your career. Uh, I am Gene Zeno, the uh, moderator uh, for today, and uh, we'll be working with our uh, guest speaker. And uh, this webinar series is brought to you by MBO Partners. And for those of you who do not know what MBO Partners does, uh, everything we do is all about making it easy for the independent consultant and for their clients. So either if you are an independent consultant or want to be an independent consultant or want to engage an independent consultant, uh, you probably should be talking to MBO Partners at www.mbopartners.com. So to get started, I'm going to just uh, go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, on your screen, you will see up in the right-hand corner uh, this little control panel. And um, <clears throat> to make sure that you have your full screen, uh, there's a little full screen icon there that you should click on in the blue circle. Uh, to ask questions, we will um, have two ways to do that. One is you could either raise your hand by clicking on a little hand icon, in which case we will uh, open the microphone and allow you to actually talk uh, and give us a question live. Or you could use the chat box on the bottom where you could actually write in a question. And uh, we will answer the question uh, either uh, through the um, uh, webinar or actually just emailing you back an answer. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that are on the presentation, uh, everybody will get a copy of the slides. So that's usually a pretty frequent question, so you could don't have to do that one. But uh, uh, we will have a open uh, question and answer session at the end. Um, we'll have about 25 or 30 minutes of remarks to walk through the presentation, and then we'll have about 15 minutes or so for uh, questions and answers. So those that you, those of you that want to write in, you could just keep uh, writing in your questions, and we'll accumulate them to the end. And those of you that want to ask a question, just raise the hit the little hand and uh, raise your hand, and we'll open up the mic one at a time for those of you. So with that, uh, let's um, introduce our guest speaker, uh, Whitney Johnson. Um, Whitney is uh, uh, a, a very uh, uh, energetic person, and I, I really think you're going to enjoy what she has to say. Uh, she's a leading thinker on the driving innovation through personal disruption and is the co-founder of Clayton Christensen's investment firm, Rose Park Advisors. And Ms. Johnson is also a frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review, uh, a former institutional investor-ranked equity analyst, and she's the author of a book which is very interesting called Dare, Dream, Do, uh, and Remarkable Things Happen When You Dare to Dream. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Whitney and uh, enjoy her uh, her uh, next 25 or 30 minutes of, of slides. Whitney, please uh, welcome and, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. Seven years ago, I startled one of my closest friends by announcing that I was going to leave Wall Street. Are you sure you know what you're doing, she asked. This was her polite, euphemistic way of wondering if I had lost my mind because I was at the top of my game. For example, I had just gone down to Mexico City for an investor day at America Mobile, one of the largest cellular companies in the world. As I saw, sat in the audience with hundreds of other people, Carlos Slim, the controlling shareholder of America Mobile and one of the richest men in the world, was quoting my research reports and referring to me as La Whitney. Meanwhile, I had analysts and investors at institutions like Fidelity asking me for my financial models, and when I upgraded, or downgraded the stock, it would typically move several percentage points. So it was with good reason that my friend was wondering if I had lost my mind, especially because getting to this place of power and respect had been so hard won. 20 years prior to that, I had arrived in New York with my husband. 
so he could pursue a PhD at Columbia University. Because we were in New York, I wanted to work on Wall Street. But as a music major, I had never set foot in an accounting or finance course. So I started out as a secretary. With a lot of hard work and a little luck, I eventually moved up the food chain to investment banker, and I stepped back to become an equity research analyst. Eight years later, after having risen to become a number one analyst, I quit that job and made plans to publish a children's book and produce a reality TV show, and instead ended up blogging about work-life issues and eventually co-founding an investment firm with Harvard Clayton Christensen. My career path has been unusual, but perhaps that is the new normal. I think the idea of a company man or woman has actually long been outdated. Since 1983, median job tenure in the U.S. is five years. For millennials, by the way, it's only 1.8 years. Baby boomers have held 11 jobs on average, while the percentages of people who stay with the company for at least 10 and 20 years, respectively, have fallen substantially. Now, career change isn't as easily documented because it's harder to define than a job switch, but the research indicates that it is becoming increasingly common. It may be difficult to make sense of these seemingly wanton but ultimately satisfying career moves until you consider the theory of disruptive innovation. For those of you unfamiliar with the theory, it is a term of art coined by Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School to describe a low-end or new market innovation that eventually upends an industry. So the disruptors secure a foothold at the low end of the market, think Japanese, Korean automakers, and then in the pursuit of profit, they gradually move up market, creating higher performance, higher margin products established competitors, like the U.S. automakers, could aggressively defend against an attack by these low-end disruptors, but they don't act because it doesn't make financial sense to defend their least profitable products when they themselves could move up market. Until, of course, it does make sense, and then by then, it may be too late. There are volumes of research indicating that the odds of success improve for companies, even countries, when you pursue a disruptive course. I believe that harnessing this powerful mindset of disruption begins with the individual. Companies don't disrupt. People do. Not everyone needs to or is going to abandon the traditional path. For those people who are working toward an ambitious goal, such as winning a C-suite job, disruption isn't necessary. But if you've reached a plateau or suspect you won't be happy on the top rung of the ladder, you may want to disrupt yourself, and perhaps you already have for the same reason that companies must. Sometimes it's to head off the competition. You realize that what you do well, perhaps even brilliantly, could eventually be done by a cheaper, more nimble version of you. But more importantly, when it comes to personal disruption, compensation is not just financial. Psychological and social factors also matter. And whether at the organizational or individual level, we all seem to follow four basic rules. Rule number one, target a need that can be met more effectively. Customers don't buy products. They actually hire them to fill a need. Thus, disruptors look for needs not being met well and play in markets where no one wants to play or has even thought of playing. For example, when I decided that I wanted to build a case for dreaming, I had a need to publish what I'd written, but that need couldn't be met by a high-end publisher. It could, however, be met by a low-end blogging platform. Now, a personal example of this is Heather Coughlin. Heather gave up an equity sales VP slot at Goldman Sachs to help launch Hudson Street, an independent research firm. Coughlin got in on the ground floor not only because she thought demand for independent research would grow, which it has, but also because she thought that her need for personal gr growth could be better met in a startup environment. Many thought it ill-advised for her to leave her comfortable perch, but the operating skills that Heather acquired in helping to build and run a research firm are what propelled her into a biz dev role and ultimately the CEO seat at ISIS Parenting. Rule number two, identify your disruptive strengths. Disruptors not only look for unmet needs, they also focus on their own distinctive strengths, trying something new rather than competing against established rivals. As an example, Skype. 
if you remember 10 years ago, Skype's signal was actually pretty inferior. So instead of skirmishing with someone like Verizon for the large corporate customers who needed superior sound quality, who did they go after? They went after the people who needed to make long distance calls but couldn't afford to, like students. And for these customers, the inferior sound quality was a very small price to pay for size distinctive strength, which was FREE. Personal example, Adam Richardson. He's working as an industrial engineer at Sun Microsystems in the 90s when he discovers that very few designers understand customer needs and could design to those needs. Now, Adam was not the strongest stylist, but he was enthralled by market research and actually very good at capturing it. So eventually his career veered from the traditional path and included the study of disciplines like anthropology, sociology, cultural theory, disciplines that are now the bedrock of his work that blends design with customer insights. So when you're disrupting yourself, you don't just think about what you do well, you think about what you do well that others don't. Rule number three, step back or sideways in order to grow. Now when organizations get too big, they often stop exploring smaller opportunities because the resulting revenue won't affect the bottom line enough. Just as borders were slow to embrace e-commerce, people can allow themselves to plateau stalling at the top of our learning curve, and we avoid that by jumping to a new curve. Now, I've talked about a couple of examples where people have left their company, but you don't necessarily have to leave your company. For example, Dave Blakely, he began his career at IDEO 20 years ago as an engineer. He could have worked his way up to manage technical staff, but instead he volunteered to become a project manager, which many of his peers dismissed as an escape route from the rigor and detail of engineering. But in making this backward move, he broadened his skill set, which allowed him to eventually climb a new ladder. And today, he's the head of technology strategy at IDEO. Clay Christensen, who I mentioned earlier, is another great example of this. At the age of 40, he left a corporate career in the material science sector in order to pursue his doctorate at Harvard. This step backward when he had five children already is what allowed him to develop a theory that has completely turned, well not completely, but has been a significant contributor to business thinking over the last 15 years. So if you want to escape getting stuck on a plateau, consider making a sideways or backward move because sometimes it turns into a slingshot. Rule number four, let your strategy emerge. This is probably something that many of you are familiar with. You are in search of a yet to be defined market, and because of that, we can't know the opportunity at the outset, and this requires an emergent strategy. Rather than performing detailed market analysis and developing a step-by-step -step plan to achieve your goal, you take a step forward, you gather feedback, and adapt accordingly. This likely means that you'll end up in a place that you had never anticipated. And the research suggests that this will likely happen. 70% of all successful new businesses end up with a strategy different from the one they initially pursued. Let's now talk about a personal example. Sabina Nawaz was moving quickly up the ranks as a computer engineer at Microsoft, probably positioning herself for a cognitive VP role when she received positive feedback about her management skills she decided to disrupt herself and ask to move into a human resources role, where she stayed for seven years. Then, rather than continuing to climb at Microsoft, she left to start her own leadership development consultancy. This had never been her ambition, but she let her career and her career strategy emerge. Are you sensing a pattern? <laughs> when I left Wall Street in 2005, uh, as I mentioned, my plan was to publish a children's book and produce a reality TV show about soccer in Latin America, neither of which happened, by the way. But then I backed a magazine that was initially quite successful and reached a circulation of 100,000, but then it ultimately failed. It was a very high price, less than in startup investing. Meanwhile, volunteer work led to a connection with Clay Christensen, and we ended up launching an investment firm. And then this past year, 
after nearly seven years of working very closely with him, I disrupted myself and am off on a new path. So we all like to make plans for the future, but following a destructive path requires a willingness to pivot and to not see the end from the beginning. Nor can you rely on the predictability of simple cause and effect. So if a switch and the light goes on, as a disruptor, you are dealing with time delays. A huge effort now may yield little in the near term, and high output in the future may be the consequence of prior action. But there are milestones that you can watch for. Just as the traditional S-curve helps us understand how quickly an innovation will be adopted, it also helps us understand personal disruption. For example, whether you are building a consulting practice or learning to play golf, we learn from the S-curve that initially progress will be quite slow, meaning based on the 10,000 hour rule, probably the first six months when you're trying to do an independent consultancy or starting a new job or anything, your progress is going to be slow. You may feel like you're flailing around. Well, the S-curve now tells you that that's exactly what's supposed to happen, and so you're less likely to be discouraged. But then as you practice deliberately, you begin to accelerate in your competence and move up the S-curve. Then as we approach mastery, we're going to feel those feel-good effects of learning something new, they'll start to diminish, and so boredom can actually kick in. When that learning crest, if we don't jump to a new curve, we can actually precipitate our own decline. Doesn't necessarily mean a financial downfall, but our emotional well-being can take a hit. Saul Kaplan, who's the author of the Business Model Innovation Factory, said, my life has been about searching for the steep learning curve. When I find that curve, I do my best work, and when I do my best work, money and stature have always followed. In other words, forget the plateau of profits, but seek and scale a learning curve. As you let your strategy emerge, it's important to find the right metrics. To think through this, I really have taken a page out of Billy Bean's playbook. For those of you unfamiliar with him, it's the story um, by the brilliant Michael Lewis of how the Oakland A's, one of the poorest teams in Major League Baseball, were able to become one of the most successful because Billy Bean, the a general manager, was willing to recast how he measured performance. Chad Bradford, for example. When the A's acquired him, Bradford's fastball was a relatively slow 81 to 85 miles per hour. And because he looked funny when he pitched, the scouts discounted him. Because Bean's foremost concern was assembling a winning team on a budget, he was willing to overlook these conventional metrics. Bradford looked funny when he pitched, and he gave up hits like any other pitcher, but they were ground balls. His ground ball to fly ratio was 5 to 1 versus 1.1 to 1. We all know that ground balls don't go over the wall. They make singles, occasionally doubles. Now, let's put this into perspective for you and me. Liz Brown, a former partner at a Boston-based law firm, Fish and Richardson, uh, is now the executive director of Golden Seeds and a professor at Bentley University. As a lawyer, we all know what her metric of success was, billable hours. At Golden Seeds, the metric for success is the number of new angel investors, and particularly women, because only 14% are women. As a professor, it's a very different metric. It's the semester-long transformation from UG into WOW as students begin to understand how pervasive and powerful the law is. So when you disrupt yourself, which you all are likely doing or thinking of doing, it's important to rethink your performance metrics. And if the conventional metrics that you've always used, like money, no longer apply, at least in the short term, then be your own Billy Bean and find the metrics that measure you. Now, <laughs> the sobering part of the conversation. While I believe that dreaming and disrupting ourselves is vital for growth, it is scary and lonely. After the rush of quitting my job in 2005 wore off, there were days when I felt a tremendous loss of identity. I could no longer pick up the phone and call someone and say, Whitney Johnson, Merrill Lynch. Now it was Whitney Johnson. And sometimes that wasn't enough. There were also days when I felt like I was on a thrill ride to zero cash flow. Now, 
it is very likely that when we do something independent on our own, disrupt ourselves, our loved ones and those who care about us, well, are actually our loved ones, may look at us and say to me, okay, let me get this straight. If disrupting yourself is scary and lonely and unpredictable and you have to part with your current stature, why are you disrupting yourself? Well, that's a good question. And there are good answers. Now, one of them you've probably already articulated. If you have that feeling in the deepest part of yourself that you must and you don't, you'll die inside a little. Hence what we call the innovator's dilemma. Whether you innovate or not, you risk downward mobility. But there is also a business case. The odds of success are six times higher. Now, they go from 6% to 36%, so you still may fail. But a six-fold six increase is pretty significant. And the revenue opportunity is 20 times greater when you pursue a disruptive course. To conclude, before we go to the Q&A, I'd like to share a poem with you by Mary Oliver. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began, but the voices around you kept shouting your bad advice. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. As you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. We give a lot of airtime to building and buying disruptive companies, but the fundamental unit of disruption is ultimately the individual. Innovation begins on the inside. So if you really want to move your world forward, the world forward, your business world, to make a dent in the world, consider playing to your distinctive strengths. Find needs that only you can meet, sometimes taking a step back in order to take a step forward. In other words, it's time to disrupt yourself. Thank you. Well, Whitney, that is uh, very, very motivating, exciting, and very thought-provoking. I have a question before I, uh, there's questions that I have queued up with, with the audience, but I, I'm going to take the first question here and ask, um, can you give us some examples of uh, the strengths that people could identify that are disruptive in themselves. Can you know what you know? What are the uh, you know three, four, five uh, typical ones that you've seen uh, where someone says, "I'm really good at this, and I need to um, uh, follow follow that and disrupt myself to try to uh, uh, leverage that strength." Okay. Well, I I think there's actually. Um it's a great question. I think it's a prior question because I think oftentimes we don't actually know what our our biggest strengths are. Um, we we somehow don't see them, and so what I would say is, um, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one is that our biggest strengths are things that we do reflexively well. In other words, we do them so well that we don't even notice that we do them. They're they're, they're like the air that we breathe, and they're the things that actually help us get done all the other hard things that we're trying to get done. So I think that one clue to that is actually when people give you a compliment that you actually find yourself sort of brushing off or dismissing over and over and over again, that is likely very much your, a strength for you. So I'll give you an example. Um, I remember a few years ago I had a colleague say to me, you know, Whitney, you're really good at connecting. Now, not necessarily just connecting people, but you're also good at looking across silos and seeing relationships where other people don't see those relationships. And I remember actually being kind of upset that he was focusing on that because I had, in being on Wall Street, worked very, very, very hard to learn how to build a very good financial model on an Excel spreadsheet. And I wanted him to say to me, you're great at building an Excel financial you know, spreadsheet. And the reality is, I'm good at it, but I'm great at this other stuff that I wanted to dismiss. And so I think one of the real clues for people to know what your disruptive strengths are are to look at those things that you do reflexively well. And you'll know by the compliments that people give you. But the other thing, too, and this comes from Marcus Buckingham, I think it's very powerful, is to, at the end of each day, note the things that you did during the course of that day that made you feel strong, that you felt 
powerful, that you felt competent, you may even felt attractive. Those are your disruptive strengths. And oftentimes, they may not be in a specific domain. They can be strengths that can cut across industries, or they may be in a domain, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter. They're just whatever they are for you. Got it. So I'm going to ask some of the questions that we have that have been um, uh, typed in through the chat window. And by the way, anybody that wants to ask a question uh, live, uh, just hit that hand button and you know, we'll uh, open up the phone lines for you. And as a motivation, Whitney said the first person that actually asks the question live is going to get a free personally signed copy of her book, Dare, Dream, Do. So there's a motivation for you. In the meantime, I'm going to uh, ask a couple of the questions that have come up. Um, uh, let's see, go, let's go to the top here. Let me go to the top here. So uh, what about, um, someone's asking, Whitney, how, how can I communicate a disruptive change with my clients? That's kind of a good question. In other words, I think what they're asking is, I've got a client base, I'm an independent consultant, but I might want to do something different. How do I communicate that uh, with my clients? Hmm. That's a great question. I've never been asked that before. I like that a lot. So, um, so assuming that um, it's with your clients, you, you want to con have that continuity with those clients, I, I suspect that what's going to happen there is that you're going to, in the course of working with them, you've found some gold dust. And when you make that change or that pivot, it is very likely that you're going to pivot toward the gold dust and as opposed to away from it. And that gold dust being the thing that actually adds the most value for your client. And so I think it's a matter of helping them um, framing in such a way of saying, I discovered that I am most valuable to you when I'm doing these three things. And when I'm doing these other three things, I'm much less valuable to you, so I'm really going to focus on these in the future. And I would be happy to help you find one or two people who can help you do these other things that I don't add as much value on. And, and recognize that that is likely going to work. But there are going to be some clients who decide that they want to go another way. But I absolutely believe, and I think you do too, is that when you will start to focus on that gold dust, you will have more clients than you believe possible because you will be playing right in your sweet spot and people will just start coming to you. I know that's sounding very new agey, but I really actually believe that. I think that's great advice. You know, I think people need to, oh, I think lots of people are trying to find what is really my talent, what is my purpose, and, you know, I think the more people do things, the more people they, the more times they, uh, the more the more opportunity they have to recognize what it is that, that it is that is uh, their true core talent and what they really do well, and um, I think it takes guts to, to take the yeah, leap and I, actually do it. You know, as you're yeah. saying that, I thought of one other thing that I think is actually really important on this, is that sometimes we don't want, we know what our talents are, we know exactly what they are, and we don't want to do them. And so I think that's the other thing to be aware of, is sometimes we don't want to do them because we're afraid of them, and sometimes we don't want to do them because we have this idea in our mind of what our parents wanted us to do or what we think society thinks will be more prestigious, and so we fight it because we, we um, Malcolm Forbes said people undervalue what they are and overvalue what they aren't. And so whatever we do instinctively well, we actually undervalue. And so I think hmm. that's, again, something for people to really consider because it's very likely that thing you do best is something that's so there that you're completely ignoring it and even dismissing it. And part of it, making this happen and be disruptive is having the courage to own what you actually do well. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, we, need, we have so many questions here. First okay. of all, there's lots of people, I'll, I'll lots of people just folder. saying, okay. no, no, a lot of people are saying, Whitney, the information is awesome. There's, there's a lot of compliments to, not questions, but to compliments as well as questions. <laughs> Here's one that I think is interesting. Um, uh, I'm easing into retirement, but still to accomplish goals, uh, they still need to accomplish goals. My resume encompasses 30 years of skills building, experience, and increasing 
responsibility. I've done the VP thing. I'm disrupting myself by consulting, and I'm wondering if you have suggestions in how to recraft a resume that reflects experience but doesn't overwhelm potential clients. That's a great question, like feeding them with a, with a fire hose. Um, OK, I have two thoughts there. Um, one is, uh, I actually, there's a woman, her name is Jackie Poindexter, and no, I'm not getting any sort of kickbacks, who does exactly this thing of crafting a resume and a story that can tell, get, provide the narrative that you may want to reach out to her. So that's a very tactical thing. But then the other piece is, you can have your bio and what you know how to do in your full glory, but then think to yourself, okay, how would I explain what I know how to do to a third grader? And then sort of start to ratchet it up so that you can sort of feed it to a person in the, the dosage that they can receive and be excited by what you know how to do as opposed to overwhelmed by it. Because oftentimes, if you're so competent, it's not that they don't want it, it's just that it's so big that it just it intimidates them and even overwhelms them. So it's really a matter of, of you know, that you have the opposite problem early on in your career of not knowing how to solve the problem that they wanted. Now it's a matter of simplifying what you know how to do enough that they can actually hear it without being overwhelmed by the decibel level because it's so impressive. OK, I'll have another question. Um, what are some tips about pairing strengths with opportunities, some strengths are hard to match with a need. That's the question. OK. So what I would say is if it's your need, then, um, then you may need to develop new strengths. If it's, if, it's someone else's, okay, if it's someone else's need, then I would say, and your strengths don't match with that, one of two things either has to happen. Either you haven't found the right need because you want to find a need that's not being met and pair it with your distinctive strength. So you, it may be a need you want to fulfill, but actually you're not ideally suited to fulfill it. So that would be the first thing I would say. And then the second thing is, um, from there, if it is a need that you can fill, but you're sort of there's a chasm between your skill and the actual need, that's where this whole idea of translation and learning how to sell comes in. And typically, I think a third party that you really trust is helpful in helping you craft that narrative to be able to bridge that gap. Because doing it on your own, I find, is tremendously difficult. Yeah, a mentor is great. Yeah. Um, another question is, someone's asking, for 50 plus professionals, how well does it work? Is age a factor? Of course it is. We all know it is. I would be lying if it weren't. That said, um, number one, I would say that um, you know, 50. If we're in very good health, I mean, we. So okay, let, let's let's take this elephant. We can look 50. We can be 50 and look 60, and we can be 50 and look 40. And I'm not talking about plastic surgery. I'm talking about being in good health, and um, and being well groomed. So let me start there, so that we sort of dismiss that. Um, in terms of being over 50, I think there are certain jobs that we cannot go for, but we're talking about being consultants. And so while on the one hand, we may not bring that you know, sort of fresh, energetic, new thing, we have that opportunity when we're over 50 to be the wise voice, the trusted counselor, you know, the, the wise patriarch or the benevolent sort of mother or woman you know, that's helping the younger group. And so I think that we just have to be willing to shift to that new place and not try to position ourselves as a bright young up-and-comer because that's not who we are at 50 plus, but instead the person that we are a go-to person in order to help people um, move their business forward because we not only have the way to, we not only can tell people what to do, we can tell them what to do because we've done it. And that's hugely valuable and we undervalue that. So, so the experience becomes one of the uh, disrupting strengths. Right. Right. It's an important calling card. And in a way to do it, though, that it's almost so subtle that they don't know that we're doing it because people don't like to be lectured to. We all, if you have children, we all know that. Or if we've ever been a child, we know we don't like to be lectured to. <laughs> Here's a question. I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer this. And Maybe I could add some color to it, but um, 
It says, I am pooling together independent consultants to create a consulting brand focused on one industry. Does that strike you as inherently problematic? Uh, and do you think it can sustain itself if these individuals stay truly independent? Um, you know what? Uh, so I'll answer quickly and then I'll let you pick it up, Gene. I would say no, of course it's not inherently problematic. It's a matter of just giving them, the, the, the challenge for you is going to be um, giving them enough value that they want to stay with you and trying to find that balance. Um, but I don't think it's inherently problematic. I don't have enough information to be able to say whether it will work or won't. And a lot of it's going to depend on how you manage it and how you incentivize the, the people. Yeah. Did you, yeah, you I, have anything I, you want to add? Yeah, I would add to that. I, I, I would say, you know, you're, you're building a portfolio of talent. And uh, the fact of whether they're truly independent or not is really not the factor. The factor is are these the right mix of people uh, that will serve the ultimate solution of what it is that you're going to deliver through your brand? And if, you, if they are, then you should have a brand that's of value, and these people will be doing what they love to do and, and do really well. And therefore, it should be very sustainable and very profitable because you have people that are doing it because they want to. So that would be my thoughts on that. There you go. Um, another question is, how can one evaluate the ability to monetize the talent one does really, wear, really well? Huh. That's a good one. Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so I... I think what has to happen, so it's a great question because the things that we do really well, we tend to give away for free. Mm -hmm. um, and again, partly because that makes us feel powerful. And so one of the things that has to happen, I think, is that um, one way that you can get yourself there is where you have a constraint. As in, I need to put food on the table, so I can't keep giving this away for free. And so you start testing the market to see if people will pay for it, and you start saying no to people when they don't want to pay for it. But um, but I think uh, but it's a matter of just starting to test. And you can't do it abruptly with your friends and family. You have to do it sort of with third-party people that you don't know. Um, but it can be a very gradual process. Like, for example, if you have a lot of people coming to you for mentoring that you don't necessarily know, then you can maybe start saying, OK, well, I'm going to be a gatekeeper here. And instead of just taking a call from everybody who calls me, I'm going to start saying to them, OK, I want you to read these three papers and then tell me why you want to reach out to me, and then I'll talk to you. And what you're doing is there's no money changing hands, but you're starting to monetize it because you're figuring out how valuable it is to people. And then, you know, and as you may know, once you do something once, you start to get a price in the marketplace, and then you can start to build out of that. So what I'm saying is minimal viable product. Do one thing, start testing it um, in sort of a barter way, and then you can potentially move to money. Great. All right, here's another good one. It seems like I never get a break from work long enough to work on myself. How can I disrupt myself when I'm just so busy? It's a great question. Um, and, and well, first of all, is it's not an easy, uh, it's not easy to do. I, I would give you two thoughts here. Number one is, as I said earlier, is disruption is about, you know, financial sometimes, psychological and social factors. So sometimes we're not disrupting ourselves because we say we don't have enough money, for example. But there may be someone, I know someone who said, I have 10 years worth of savings in the bank, and I'm still not willing to disrupt myself. So there was something else going on, psychological or emotional. Um, but a more practical way of approaching this is to do what I call dating dreams and ideas, is if you have like 10 different things that you think you want to try, the first step would be, write them down on a paper, and promise yourself that you'll date each one of them for five minutes a day. So you'll see date these ideas for five minutes a day for the next 10 days. And then rank order the ones that were the most fun, and then continue to follow up on them. Then once you start to have something that's a little bit interesting to you, you can gain traction by creating some sense of accountability 
um, and or uh, accountability mechanisms. So for example, if you want to write, well, the best way to start forcing yourself to write every day is not to say, you're going to go into an ivory tower and write, just start a blog. Because once you get 20 people reading your blog, you feel some sense of accountability to blog at least once a week. And so then that idea that you had starts to germinate. It starts to gain traction. And then it can eventually grow you know, over the next six months to a year so that you're a point where that jumping to the new curve, you de-risked it, and it's much less scary. But until you're willing to do something that will allow something to gain traction, you'll probably just keep working a lot. So part of it's starting in really baby steps, but it can get big enough that you're not as sort of afraid to do it, and, and you actually want to do it. Dating ideas, that's, um, that's a great concept. You know, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I, I saw a, I um, can't think of his name, but um, uh, it was on one of the TED Talk um, um, videos, actually talked about how ideas have sex, and they okay. create it new was, ideas. Uh, uh, jobs worth. Um, J.P. Rangaswamy. Yes. He's at right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. He's interesting. Yeah. I thought that. So I, I figured yeah. I'd mention that. In fact, that. another thing he said that I love is that he said that um, uh, Twitter is like um, a pheromone for ideas and people which is fantastic, right? Yeah. So, there you go. All right, here's someone that's interested in healthcare and says, have you attempted to introduce disruptive innovation in a healthcare environment, such as a hospital, where getting out, where getting out of the box is considered dangerous? Um, well, so that is not my specialty, but if you haven't a um, couple things. Number one is if you haven't read The Innovator's Prescription by Craig Christensen, I would definitely recommend it because he spends, you know, four or five hundred pages on talking about disruption in healthcare. And I would also take a look at what Athena Healthcare is doing because they've definitely applied these models. Um, and I think you're, to your point, there in healthcare in particular, a lot of this disruption is going to have to take place out on the periphery as opposed to within the hospital. That's like trying to storm the fortress, and it's not going to happen within the fortress per se. It's going to have to happen out on the fringes. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> we uh, are coming down to uh, some of the final questions. So here's one that says, can you disrupt and be employed at the same time? For those on the fence, how can you try it before you buy it? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, great question. I would say um, uh, I, I would go back to what I said earlier to the the prior question is um, to start, you know, dating some ideas and carving out a way again, creating some type of accountability mechanism so that once you've made the decision that you want to try it, you actually do try it, so that you're not just walking to the, you know, walking to the pool and not ever actually drinking the water. So I think that that's probably the, the best way to do it. The other way you can do it within an organization, but it's certainly more difficult, is to start thinking about how do I really, have I gotten good at socializing my ideas within my organization? Have I gotten good at socializing them laterally, socializing them up, socializing them down, so that I can see if there's a possibility for me actually to find a way to disrupt myself within the organization? Because some, if you're on the fence, maybe, maybe it isn't that you want to leave your job and sort of cast everything off and go do something else. It may be just that you need something fresh in your organization. So I would look at it as a possibility of socializing your ideas and seeing if that's an organization that is open to that, because you may be able to craft a new role for yourself within the existing organization. Terrific. Well, we're coming up to a quarter uh, uh, to the hour, so I'm going to say that if anybody has any other questions, um, do please submit them, and you know we'll have uh, Whitney follow up an email, and um, certainly uh, also get you a copy of all the slides, uh, and uh, certainly uh, check out Whitney's book, Dare Dream Do. Um, and uh, I'm just going to. Um, uh, wrap up and uh, if we could just get to the next slide and um, give you information as to uh, if you want additional information about the, our webinar series, just um, sign up uh, at uh, info at mbopartners.com. You just email us at info at mbopartners.com. And um, 
uh, again, uh, feel free to visit our website and uh, learn more about uh, everything to do with independent consulting. So with that, I'm going to say thank you, uh, everybody. Whitney, thank you so much. It was uh, great having you as our speaker. We appreciate you uh, participating, and uh, I appreciate everybody's time, and have a uh, great day.